So welcome back to the Centre for Peace and Conflict Research's annual conference. So we're going to finish today's proceedings with a keynote lecture from Professor Catherine Turner of Durham University. So Catherine is an academic and consultant who advocates for greater use of inclusive mediation and peacemaking practice through research and policy engagement. She's currently Professor of International Law at Durham University and the Deputy Director of Durham Global Security Institute. She has published extensively in the fields of peace mediation and transitional justice, focusing on promoting more inclusive approaches to peace and justice. Catherine has consulted widely on inclusive leadership and increasing participation in peace processes for international organisations, governments and charities, including the UN, the International Peace Institute, Beyond Border Scotland and Conciliation Resources. She is the partner lead for Durham University and the UK government's Women, Peace and Security Help Desk, which provides expert uh, policy advice on gender and security to departments across His Majesty's government and embassies abroad. She has extensive experience as a practitioner, trainer and facilitator in mediation and good relations both in Northern Ireland and internationally. She has designed and delivered bespoke training in women's leadership and peace mediation, as well as training and facilitation in transitional justice and peace mediation for women from conflict affected states across the world. Um, she is currently a member of NATO Civil Society Advisory Panel and of the International Research Group on Peace Mediation and Dialogue um, at Folk Bernadette Academy, Sweden. She is also an Associate Fellow of the Geneva Centre for Security Policy and on the Board of Conciliation Resources EU, EU office. So as you can see, uh, there is no doubt that Catherine really embodies this idea of research at practice. Uh, sorry, research um, at work, and um, that she is by no means an academic in an ivory tower, so she has a wealth of experience working with policymakers and practitioners. Um, and reflecting on this work and on her own research, she's going to deliver a keynote um, called Bringing the Whole Self to Work in Conflict and Peace Studies. So, Catherine, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Dawn, um, for the introduction and, and thank you also for the invitation uh, to join you um, in the conference today. Um, that was absolutely fabulous last panel and <laughs> really um, interesting um, themes from, from the research. I think some of which I'm going to touch on um, in, in my, in my uh, observations. So this is a subject, um, as you can imagine, that I get asked about a lot. A lot of people sidle into my office and they say, you must tell me how you do this. Um, so when I was invited to um, sorry, um, when I was invited to uh, speak on this theme of, of research at work, um, it prompted me to reflect um, on what does it mean to be an academic engaged in practice. And as Dawn has said, this has been a, a particular feature of my career, really from the outset, but more so from the past number of years. And increasingly. I find myself thinking not only about the professional aspects of engaging with practice, but also about the personal side of it as well. So what is it that motivates me or us to get involved with the worlds of policy and practice that are so different from the academy where we maybe feel more at home? And how do the personal and the professional selves interact when it comes to this field of work? And I think this question is particularly pronounced for the field of peace and conflict studies because of the nature of the subject matter that we're dealing with. So this afternoon I want to reflect on a career journey in theory and practice, thinking about how we as academic researchers shape and are shaped by our interactions in practice and in the world of work. So in this field we're well accustomed to thinking about the relationship between theory, policy and practice. And when it comes to peace and conflict, we have a tripartite system of knowledge production that includes our own academic knowledge, but also policy making and, of course, the wisdom of practice. And these are most often separate spheres of knowledge with, dare I say it, some degree of rivalry between the three at times. And we acknowledge the difference between the three and that there are fundamentally different ways of experiencing work in this field. But we also recognise the value of working together to address real world problems. And it's in this interaction between these spheres that really exciting new insights emerge. So whether that's the academic being exposed to the realities of practice, or the practitioner enrolling on the PhD programme to help them make sense of years of practical wisdom. But increasingly there's a demand that we as academics demonstrate real world value of our research. 
And this has driven the requirement for us to engage in the policy and practice space, more so than in, in previous generations. However, rather than respecting these subtle differences of expertise, this can sometimes lead academics to attempt to wear two or even three different hats. So what happens when we try to combine all three of these different areas of expertise into the same person? So what I want to ask and to reflect on is how our values and the personal selves that we bring to this uh, work and our understanding of the ethical imperatives of peace and conflict research determine how we engage in practice and indeed the relationship between practice and the possibility of the academy. So let's start with the early career. So for most of us, our professional identities and our research agendas are a process of evolution. There are very few of us at 18 years old who have a clear picture of where our careers are going to take us. But in this field, what many of us do have is an innate interest in questions of war, peace and justice. And this may come from lived experience for those who grew up in conflict affected societies, or it may come from a more intellectual interest in the world around us and with all the problems that we see on the news day in and day out. But what unites us is that we come with questions. As young adults, we seek not simply answers, but the tools for understanding the challenges that we face. And for many, the desire to enter this particular field is an ethical one. We're motivated by a desire to understand and to be able to contribute towards efforts for peace. And so our university course is key. It's where we learn how to make sense of these questions, and it's where we are inspired to follow particular career paths and to orient ourselves towards particular goals. And the world of learning that's opened up in the undergraduate degree is the foundation for the rest of that career. But it's also at the end of the undergraduate degree that initial preferences are formed about the type of work that we're going to pursue and how we're going to make a difference. So do we want to continue along the research path to aim for an academic career in which we ourselves contribute to that world of learning? Or do we want to get out and to apply that new knowledge and skills to real world problems? And I'd hazard a guess that for most people, it's the latter choice that appeals. We've had enough of learning, we've had enough of exams, now we just want to get out and do it. And even for those of us who do end up in the academy, this period of time is often marked by exploration of the career possibilities through the internship, through work experience or the stage. And the internship represents for many of us the first exposure to the real world of peace and conflict. And we seek out these opportunities because we have the desire to do good, to contribute to the goals of peace. And so our starting point then, the reasons that we choose certain organisations or, or subject matters to experience, is already driven by values and a sense of how we can do good. And we bring these values and these expectations with us into our early encounters with the world of work. But the process itself is also one which helps us to refine those values. Through exposure to that world of work, we move from an abstract idea that we would like to work in this field of peace and conflict towards a more concrete idea of how ideas and policies are institutionalised. And indeed, what impact that institutionalisation has on bigger ethical questions that we have. For example, we may dream of working for the United Nations, of contributing to the noble goal of, world, uh, goal of world peace or of international justice, for example. But the realities of working within the UN system are starkly revealed in the course of even a short internship. For some, this will be the beginning of a journey in practice. For others, and many who end up in academia, it can be a Damascene moment where we realise that the institutional priorities and politics of big, bureauc uh, big bureaucratic bodies will likely take precedence over ethical questions. But similarly, we may be lucky enough to find ourselves in an organisation that fundamentally challenges or reshapes some of the assumptions that we had developed in our university courses. We may find an organisation whose values so thoroughly match ours that it goes on to shape our whole career path, whether in practice or through the ways in which we bring those ideas, those approaches and those values back into our work in the academy. So from this formative experience, we refine further our understanding of what it is that motiv us, motivates us to work in this field. And it's a deeply personal process, uh, but it's the one that lays the foundations of how we will engage for the rest of our careers. And this is important because in this field, and from my experience of engaging in the peace mediation space in particular, there is no one right way to engage, but there's a range of possibilities that depend very much on the values of the individual. 
And so understanding the significance of those values in this process and the ways in which we bring the whole self to work is important as it's going to determine our experience of trying to bring our research into work. But the early years in the academy can be frustrating. So once we've moved beyond the internship or the work experience phase, we find ourselves on the cold face of higher education and the possibilities can once again seem diminished. So we know that we would like to engage with practice and we watch with frustration as our senior colleagues seem to snap up all these wonderful opportunities to write the reports, to deliver the training, or to advise the bodies that we admire. And we wonder why not us and when will our turn come? And I remember it vividly myself. And I also recognize it in my own PhD students and my early career colleagues who are trying to get their foot on that ladder. But the early career stage of, uh, of the academic career, and particularly the PhD, should be primarily oriented to academic knowledge. It should be about learning the theories and the tools of research that enable you to design a research project that brings new insight to persistent challenges in practice. The PhD is the stage where you should be developing the critical thinking capacity, offering radical critiques of the canon or of the orthodoxies of practice. For once you have these skills, they'll distinguish you for the rest of your career from the policymaker or the practitioner. And not in a hierarchical way, but as a necessary part of the knowledge production ecosystem and able to contribute to the world of practice in the ways that they need. And so the skills that you develop will enable a process of engagement as your career progresses. And that's going to enable you to engage on a different level than if you went in from the outset. As the academic career progresses, there is more pressure to write to externally imposed benchmarks, to temper the critical nature of your written work, to ditch the post-structural philosophy, for example, and to write in a way that real people can understand. Um, and that's particularly the case for those who do want to engage with practice. And I recall in my own early career, those, uh, uh, my sort of my disappointment with people that I had admired as critical scholars who had increasingly moved towards the mainstream. And yet, as I progress through the years, I understand why it happens. But I also understand that the critical foundation of the PhD years is what enables us to see problems in different ways. And while the language might change and the tools or the ways that we engage might change, the skills and, and the questioning mind are still there. But while the early career is spent laying the foundations of our claims to expertise, there can come a point when you start to experience something of a crisis of vocation, or certainly on my part anyway. The process of researching, writing and publishing research that then is subject to further scrutiny only from within the academy can lead to questions about the value and the contribution of our work, particularly when we are uh, motivated uh, by a desire to make a difference in the real world. So we can find ourselves asking what's the point of all this academic or in the UK education parlance four star research that I'm doing if nobody reads it. And at this time in the mid-career, then the pull towards practice becomes stronger. Exploration of the possibilities of engagement in this place called the real world um, reveals an ecosystem of practice that we must now learn to navigate. And this is where the personal and the professional become further entwined. For there are a range of different ways of engaging in the real world, and they involve ethical and normative choices on our part. So I hope you'll forgive me, but this is my unscientific mini um, ethnography of the peace mediation space based on many years of engaging with different people in here. So I'm going to draw on examples from my own experience, uh, which is peace mediation and peace support, peace process support, which is a field of practice which has expanded rapidly in the past uh, couple of decades and as such has yielded good opportunities for bringing research into practice and into work. And it also, for me, provides really good examples of the fundamentally different ways that there are of engaging in this space. So what does this ecosystem look like? I did not meet the deadline for slides, so I, <laughs> so I will describe it. And so I've got four specific categories um, of uh, ways of engaging or, or groups with whom we might engage in this space. So the first are parties. The second are governments uh, slash donors slash international organizations, so broadly classed as political actors. The third are technical or professional support actors. And the fourth is activism. And each of these, as I'll outline, are driven by different motivations which shape the ways in which we engage as academics or researchers. And we have opportunities for engagement across each of the sectors 
But as you can imagine, the ways in which we engage will vary significantly depending on where we ourselves are positioned within this ecosystem. And so to think about this, I want to think about two questions. First of all, what do we want from them? And second, what do they want from us? So a key driver of the move of academics into practice uh, in a more systemic, uh, sorry, systematic way than in the past has been pressure from funders, from governments and others to demonstrate academic impact. Um, impact through which we shape the direction of policy or law or engagement in which we, effect, uh, we in effect provide expert services for the benefit of the public good uh, with community groups or, or non-academic groups, for example. But this is a fairly specific understanding um, of the purpose of engagement that can lead to some mismatched expectations when it comes to engaging in practice and with practitioners. So let's look at the relationships in the different spheres. So starting off with parties. In the context of a peace process, the parties are our central players. Uh, and by parties here, I mean uh, those who are involved in party politics, including governments, um, those who participate as negotiators in talks, or those representing oppositions, whether those are political or armed oppositions. So they engage in these processes from a one-sided position in a negotiation, in which they set out to secure the best possible gains for themselves. And this is true whether we're talking about peace talks, or in other fora, such as in, in litigation, because this would be a popular way for international lawyers to, to engage. So parties are therefore going to be looking for research expertise that supports the position that they want to establish as far as possible, in the same manner as working with political parties. So we have a certain degree of transparency from the outset in what they stand for and what they are likely to want from engaging with you as a researcher. And opportunities here then most often come in the role of advisor. And it can be a really attractive um, option for researchers. The opportunity to engage in depth in the formulation of negotiating positions or on the preparation of legal arguments in support of a particular cause. We like to think that we bring research expertise that's rooted in rigor and impartiality to this role. And we benefit in being able to shape an agenda and the parties benefit from our expertise in strengthening their arguments. Our expertise can help to refine the, their position and to improve the overall quality of the argument that's being made. However, while we may like to think that engagement in this space can happen on the basis of impartiality, for parties, such an advisory role is often likely to be agenda-driven. They'll choose the person whose research supports the position they want to establish in the hope that that expertise will help to consolidate their gains. And so there's a risk with this form of engagement for academics that we ourselves come to be associated with the agenda of the parties, branded as belonging to one side or the other. And in that context, we need to ask ourselves, um, are the positions supported by these parties positions that we too can support? Are we happy to have our own research used publicly in support of this cause? And this, of course, will depend very much on the nature of the positions and of the research. So an expert paper on water security in the context of a peace process is less likely to be viewed as politically motivated than advice on thornier political issues such as rights or power sharing, for example. But as we know, in conflict-affected societies, absolutely everything has the potential to be politicised. So we engage in this space with our eyes open to the risk of co-option on those grounds. And in the absence of opportunities or desire to engage with parties in, in, on these terms, the next option comes in the form of the now large community of donors and international organisations involved in peace process support. So a formal multi-track peace process will itself be a large bureaucratic machine. So far from an individual mediator facilitating communication between our parties, the process will involve a range of different institutional players in different roles. And this is the machinery that supports the multi-track process. It might include, for example, an international political mission led by an envoy who's the figurehead of the mediation effort. And the envoy will then be surrounded by a team of expert advisors who provide advice on a whole range of subject matters, from the design of the process to inclusion, constitutional reform, transitional justice, security sector reform, for example. And in addition to this political mission, we're going to increasingly have other thematic institutions or bodies. So the United Nations Development Programme and UN Women in particular are often engaged in support of these processes. 
These agencies op um, offer to support um, and engagement in supportive initiatives at track two and track three. So the informal processes below the level of political talks, um, whether that's sort of at mid-level or in grassroots. And each of these institutions bring their own working policies and practices with them. And of course, the efforts don't come for free. They're supported primarily by states who are involved as donors through their embassies abroad. And each donor country, in addition to the international organisations, each donor country will have their own rules and their own regulations, and indeed their own interests that underpin their support for the process. And these will vary according to the political positionality of the state. So for example, Switzerland or Norway or Ireland are motivated by very different interests than the US, for example, or Qatar or China. And understanding these motivations is a key part of understanding the landscape with which we're seeking to engage and where and how we might be able to make a difference. So as I've said, actors in this category are governmental or intergovernmental. They operate on the basis of official political positions. So whether they are collectively negotiated and agreed in multilateral fora, or whether they flow from domestic and foreign security policy that comes from the capital. And engagement with these organisations then for us requires the ability to operate in a fairly specific way in the language and in the rules of the game of the organisations themselves. So as I said, they're often large institutions where the internal logics of the institution can tend to outweigh the ethical imperative that they are pursuing. And I include in this category, as I said, national governments operating in the role of donor as well as multilateral organisations, so primarily the UN, NATO, the World Bank, and the EU and others. And the lure of working with these institutions is strong. So to be able to say that our research has been used by the UN, for example, is the stuff of dreams for many of us. And the elusive goal of international impact of one's research? So who among us does not dream of being the academic whose research becomes the global, academic, or the global sound bite? So the, the one who coins the phrase, peace processes that include women are more sustainable, for example, the type of research that is repeated in policy for years to come. But in reality, this is extraordinarily difficult to achieve. So first up, as I said, these are bureaucratic organisations. Often by the time they get to the point of commissioning you as a consultant or an expert to do some work for them, they've already decided what they want the output to say. If they haven't got, quite got that far, they are still constrained by layers of policy, by this carefully negotiated position, um, or by the instructions from their capitals that constrain what's possible. They're guided by their own norms and value-based frameworks, and these will most likely dictate the extent to which you are able to bring new perspectives from your research to bear on their policy and practice. And so this is a process of negotiation between what you as an academic would like to say on the one hand, and what the sponsoring agency wants to or can say or can say on the other. And participatory action research is increasingly popular when it comes to both the design and the evaluation of peace building programs by governments. And often academics are involved in these processes. But imagine the frustration when you, the consultant, drawing on all your research expertise, you design the participatory workshop, you collect rich data from the relevant populations, and you, pres uh, and you present it to the team that's commissioned you um, in a way that is going to enable transformative change in this field. Only to be told, but we can't say that. Right? And this raises specific ethical questions for, in many cases. So the question then for us as academics seeking to engage in, in, with these organisations is whether or not these values are sufficiently aligned with our own to enable us to engage without compromising our own academic integrity. For example, working with the military, with big finance or oil companies can provide either an opportunity to engage where change is most needed, on the one hand, or a complete betrayal of one's principles, depending on how you look at it. And for some, the ability to be a critical friend to these institutions is key. There are people working within them who are motivated to make change. And these people often benefit from support from academics who are willing to work with them and to help to bring about that change. But the pace of this change tends to be slow, and the outcome is often less radical or less transformative than we would like. There's also a very real risk of our research or our participation in the institutions uh, being used to legitimise uh, 
problematic bodies. So for the academic, the ability to retain a critical distance and to be willing to offer criticism when it is needed is key. And there are wonderful opportunities to work with and to learn from these organisations. But the gap between we, what we want from them and what they want from us can be particularly pronounced in this category. But in many ways, the experience will be determined by our own expectations. For some of us, the purpose of bringing research into work is to try and shape ways of thinking, to bring values-based change to the system. This might end in frustration, but it may not. And for others, research presents less a value-oriented endeavour and more of a scientific project that can help to provide the objective information and knowledge needed to improve outcomes in these processes. And so our third area of engagement then comes with technical peace process support. So another effect um, of the growth of the multi-track peace process has been the parallel growth of this whole field of professional peace process support. Peace mediation was once a relatively narrow activity which aimed simply to end violence by brokering a deal between warring parties. But the evolution of peace policy at the UN and the trickle-down effect of this policy to other actors, such as regional organisations, has seen an increasing emphasis placed on the peace process as the means of renegotiating social contracts that have been fractured by war and violence. And so a comprehensive peace process or peace agreement will involve a whole new range of actors who would previously not have had a seat at the negotiating table. And this is the inclusive peace process. And as I said, these processes have led to a boom in the number of organisations offering professional support in country. So actors in this category tend to be mostly, although not exclusively, quasi-governmental. So often arm's length bodies of donor governments who receive funding to deliver the operational side of foreign policy when it comes to either peace and security or development. So if we think, for example, of Folke Bernadotte in Sweden, um, the Marty Atasari Peace Foundation in Finland, for example, or organisations like Geneva Call and the Centre for Humanitarian Dialogue in Switzerland. But the key distinction is that these are operational bodies, not political actors. And while they may receive funding from government, they are operationally independent of government. And so we do have some degree of overlap here with the types of engagement that are available with international organisations, but th there, is a, there is a distinct field um, of technical support that is not agenda driven or value driven in the same way as others. It's not to say they don't have values, they do, but the values um, are secondary to the technical or the professional ways in which they operate, or the values enable professional, technical, impartial ways of operating. So engagement in this space will be on the basis of impartiality for the most part. Organisations will work with all parties involved in conflict, irrespective of their conduct. And they're often the most effective first points of contact with armed groups because they're not constrained by the same political positions as states or international organisations when it comes to issues such as counter-terrorism sanctions, for example, or negotiating with those who are accused of or indicted for war crimes. And from this perspective, these organisations play a specific and important role in the ecosystem that is only possible because of the value of impartiality. Opportunities can arise in this space for those with particular research backgrounds or expertise in a specific conflict or specific parties to a conflict, such as expertise in armed groups. They can be invited into this process to help to provide advice on how to engage and on the likely positions of these actors. And this process requires a certain degree of agnosticism to violence from all involved. Engagement in talks with violent actors and with those whose ethical positions that we may find repugnant requires the ability to set those particular views aside and to operate on the basis of a different set of values, such as inclusion, that requires engagement with those with whom we disagree. But it's also an ethical choice. It's a decision made that the ethical consequences of talking to these people is less bad, or are less bad, than the consequences of failing to make an effort to end violence. It's not a passive choice, but an active one. And it's a specific form of engagement that's not for everyone. But there are other ways of engaging in this space. These organisations have really driven the growth of expertise-based policy on inclusion, particularly in peace processes. Often working alongside or funded by other larger organisations like UN Women, these organisations have worked on the ground to design inclusion programmes that have subsequently become practice notes and guidance that shape other processes. 
And because of this normative trajectory of the work, in many cases, the organisations have created particular opportunities for bringing research uh, together with practice. And these opportunities arise from two different angles. The first is the use of research to help these organisations define problems or explore new directions. And the second is in capturing of learning and the development of normative standards from learning and practice. So the first area then, that of using research to help define problems and new directions and potential solutions, is an area where there's increasing demand for research and particularly for data-driven approaches that can bring objective information to bear on the very complex systems of conflict. And I think that was well uh, demonstrated in the papers earlier on. And often this is driven by engagement, specifically with research projects that are designed to further these agendas. For example, where international organisations work in support rather than political roles, um, places like the United Nations Mediation Support Unit um, has an innovation cell that has been a key user of research on data and AI, seeking to understand how these can be used to make peace process support more effective. The same unit has also commissioned research on behavioural science and cognitive science in attempts to understand how learning in these disciplines might help us to understand how parties behave in peace processes. And so this space is ideal for those who bring scientific method to these questions, particularly those working with data sets and quantitative findings that can allow organisations to point to specific data that confirm their preferred uh, direction of, of travel policy-wise. And it's really the golden goose for academics seeking to demonstrate that their research is useful in practice. And the second approach arises then when these organisations seek to capture the learning from their own practice. They are top recruiters of academics to help in these processes. For example, new uses of technology and peacemaking are now in the process of being evaluated, but also theorised by academics. And in this context, these organisations will create partnerships um, with the academics involved in the relative area and commission them to do this work for them. And I've seen this increasingly now, the desire not only to capture in a report the learning or, or what was done in a process, but also to theorise it, so to try and get it into the academic debates and an increasing kind of acknowledgement that getting into theoretical debates is, is useful for this type of work. And so for the academic, to get the, the academic, they get access to data and they get first-hand accounts from practitioners and parties. For the host organisation, they get the benefit of research expertise that allows conclusions of greater significance to be produced from their work. And in this field, there is a nice symbiotic relationship between research and practice, where organisations increasingly recognise the value of two-way engagement between academics and practitioners in enhancing the overall process of, of knowledge production. And this is a fairly refreshing break from hearing very often, we don't need academic analysis, we need real world applications. Yeah. So the, the, um, I think the increasing um, recognition that it's a two way process and can be beneficial to both is, is welcome. And so the final category then is one uh, where there tends to be good alignment between research and practice. So while each of the categories that discussed uh, involved some form of formal connection to the political and institutional forms of peacemaking, the missing piece so far is that of activism, so engagement in the process from outside. Modern peace processes recognise a specific role for civil society. And this also arises from the evolution of peace mediation from elite bargaining towards comprehensive processes that build social relationships. The inclusion of civil society has been particularly consolidated through the Women, Peace and Security Resolutions, which identify civil society as the primary vehicle through which women tend to participate in political life, making engagement with civil society a key mechanism for ensuring that women and their rights are included in these processes. And we do have some degree of overlap here with the category of technical peace process support, where a number of NGOs, non-governmental organisations, are supporting inclusion initiatives as civil society engaged in various capacities in multi-track processes. This includes providing training and support to women participating in the initiatives, or being involved in advocacy campaigns to raise awareness of the need for women's inclusion. But of course, the idea of civil society is much broader than a specific category of women's rights organisations. And it's also much broader than a technocratic view of inclusion that seeks to accommodate civil society within the bureaucratic structures of the multi-track process. It includes not only those who work in the system, but those whose political activism challenges the system. And civil society activism is a key part of the ecosystem of practice. 
It's the space where those who do not feel that they can in good conscience engage with governments or international organisations whose values they find repugnant become involved. It's a way of bringing pressure to bear from outside the system. And it's an unapologetic process of exerting pressure for change. And this type of engagement is necessary, as it often helps to force issues onto an agenda that might otherwise get sidelined because they're not convenient politically. And the Women, Peace and Security agenda and the push to have women included in efforts at peace and security is a prime example of the importance of this type of work and the impact that it can have. For academics, NGOs can be very natural allies. The relationship between the two is one of mutual support. So research helps to provide evidence to substantiate demands for change. And NGOs provide a vehicle for bringing that research to the attention of the relevant audiences. Because academics will often lack the knowledge required to build a successful advocacy campaign, or indeed the time. And our tools are very different from those of NGOs. But the two working together can be a very powerful combination. In settled democracies, this is a natural partnership and one which brings little material risk. But in the context of peace processes, the potential cost is much higher. It's most often the role of NGOs and activists to highlight injustices, to take the risks of demanding change, and to shed light on the hypocrisy of political positions. They're crucial in holding political actors to account for the consequences of their actions or their inactions. But as a result, they're in a very vulnerable position. Recent attacks on civil society, and the closing of civic space in many conflict-affected countries demonstrates just how dangerous it can be to raise your voice in this way and the extent of the moral courage required by those who do. And for academics in this space, the aim then is to use research to put pressure on authorities, whether local, national or international, to bring about that change. And the change that we want to see is rooted in our academic analysis of the limits of current policy and the need to deliver better outcomes. It's the ethical imperative of using one's expertise to make a difference. But there are some risks. So activism is specifically a small p political activity. It's overtly normative and it's associated with the adoption and the maintenance of positions. And recently, in some cases, and recently this has left um, academics open to charge that their activism undermines the credibility of their academic work. The charge of being an activist academic as a derogatory, in, a, in a derogatory sense because it's seen as being agenda-driven rather than rooted in partial and scientific method of inquiry. There's also a risk that the work gets subsumed into a broader dynamic that extends beyond what we intend. For example, Shomaris's work on NGO activism and specifically on the Coney campaign at the ICC has demonstrated how these campaigns can sometimes get carried away in their own logic, becoming detached from the realities of the problem that they're seeking to address. And so we need to be careful that our expertise is not used in service of um, alternative agendas that can then call it our credibility into question. We need to maintain control of the relationship. What the patchwork demonstrates is the range of different approaches and opportunities that exist. I think I mean ecosystem there. Each of these will require different skills, but more fundamentally, they also require different personality types. The ecosystem is comprised of a whole diversity of values that individuals bring to work with them. And each is necessary for the functioning of the system. So parties in conflict need expert advisors who can help them formulate and make sense of their positions. Donors and international organisations need critical friends who are willing to accompany those who seek to make change from the inside of the system. Technical support relies on those who are able to bring a scientific mindset to the big problems faced. And the pursuit of radical change, and indeed justice, requires those who are willing to be outspoken and to demand change, even where it makes them unpopular with the establishment. And without this diversity, the ecosystem doesn't function. And while they can be diff radically different approaches, what unites the people engaged in them is belief in the value of what they are doing and in the interaction of the personal and the professional self in this space. And so this brings me then to the final question of the impact of polarisation on the possibilities of bringing the whole self to work in this space. Because it is deeply personal and it's often driven from positions of, of personal experience. But the academy is a place of critical thought. So we're trained to believe in scientific rigour of our work and namely that the tools that we're trained to use and that are training in these methods guarantees the robustness of our findings. 
We're also trained to think of ourselves as experts, as bringing novel insight to gaps in a research field that nobody else has thought about. Now, there is an inevitably a high degree of self-reflection involved in our choices about where to engage and how. And these choices are rooted in years of experience and the values that have been shaped by that experience. But the polarisation that we're seeing in the political realm poses challenges to this and our ability to engage as experts. The effect of social media has been to create not only a platform for the exchange of views, but has arguably diminished capacity for civic dialogue. Deliberate strategies are used to undermine expertise and to dismiss the need to engage with other views. And we see this happening in academic discourse too. The pull towards absolutist positions because of the need to be seen to be appropriately positioned on a particular topic. And this is particularly important in the academy because advancing knowledge and solving problems requires interrogation of orthodoxies and established positions. And if this is not possible, then the academy loses its heart. As we seek to demonstrate real world relevance, we can easily slip into a trap of thinking that we need to establish that our way is the best way or the only way of thinking about a particular problem. And we secretly, or maybe not so secretly, depending on our personalities, want to be the one cited on the news as the authority on a particular topic of the day. And it encourages communication and sound bites and presentation of information in ways that's easily picked up. And while this could be a good thing that we're able to communicate complex ideas simply, it can also do a disservice to the depth of expertise that we profess in our subject areas at times. Because with the loss of depth, there's a risk of loss of nuance and complexity that academic rigor should bring to these issues over time. And it also doesn't take into account the different limitations faced by different people when engaging online and the personal decisions that people make at all about how will they will engage in these professional spaces. So we're seeing increasing amounts of research um, on the impact uh, of women in political spaces, um, women being attacked online and, and women politicians um, facing strategies to, to silence them. And this all feeds into this dynamic of who um, has the authority to speak and who does not. And so what are the implications of this polarisation for the very ethos of ethically or value-driven research? If we accept that values differ and that they are shaped by real-world experience, as well as our own views on the most appropriate way to engage, how then do we hold a space for a respectful exchange of views that characterises this debate? How do we ensure that we retain the capacity for such engagement without causing harm, either intentionally or not? We understand the centrality of concepts such as do no harm and positionality when it comes to engaging in conflict affected societies. And we're sensitive to vulnerabilities and to the consequences of our own actions in these places. So why not in our engagement with each other? I often reflect that there's much, uh, much that learning from mediation has to offer for other contexts. Fundamental to mediation is the ability to listen and to hear others. This doesn't mean that everybody needs to occupy the middle ground, but it does mean that we need to be able to hold a space for dialogue, recognising that there are people whose views are radically different from our own. And crucially, we need to understand that those views themselves also come from a position of experience and values, just in the same way that our own do. But then, we could argue that I would say this, I'm naturally a mediator, a conciliator, I don't have the gravel in the gut to be a negotiator. <laughs> okay, so I acknowledge the positionality in, in this, but it's, it's my, uh, my value-based assessment. <laughs> um, but the positionality comes from 20 years of uh, research and practice in this field. In having my assumptions about the values of law and justice challenged, and of finding values that I believed in through mediation, and having those values shape my academic research, which now feeds into policy in this field. So my point is certainly not that we all need to be friends all of the time, but rather that by acknowledging our own positionality, we can temper the nastier consequences of polarisation by being open to listening and understanding what is being said and why. And in this way, we also bring practice into research. And finally, I want to close the circle, as they say in practice, by returning to the question of the university. Having spent many years now engaging with policymakers, I'm struck by the fact that the single biggest impact that academics have on work is through their teaching. I think we underestimate at times the influence that our teaching has on our students who go out into the world of practice in this field, 
whether that's in government, in international organisations or in NGOs. And it's an absolute joy to come across them years later, working in positions of influence. Huh? But much of this engagement is done with staff at the mid-career point. Those who left university roughly 15 years previously. And it's really notable that their understanding of core issues and the lens through which they view their tasks is often directly influenced by the dominant schools of thought from their time at university, and particularly those who do specialist masters in the field. And the way in which, so the way in which we teach ideas, the paradigms that we validate, and the research that we legitimate through inclusion on our reading lists has a much deeper impact than we may realise at the time, for it creates the lens through which our students will approach their professional careers for 20 years. And this, in turn, will have a direct impact on the direction of policy and practice. And again, we only need to think of the dominance of certain policy sound bites to realise that the crossover from education can help to consolidate policy impact for generations. So I'm thinking, for example, of the mutually hurting stalemate and the persistence of that particular paradigm. These become consolidated policy positions because successive years of students learn and internalise them as the correct way to approach real world problems. They bring this learning to their work and with them, uh, with them and they apply it as a correct way. So while we may sometimes face criticism for being too ivory tower or for not having any real world expertise, this does not account for the very real impact that we have on the entire system of knowledge production. And so we must carry this responsibility wisely to shape critical minds infused with ethical concern and with the ability to engage in this polarised world on the basis of respect. Thank <laughs> you.